Welcome to the 29th episode of our podcast series for advisors considering the independent space. Today's episode is The Risks and Rewards of Independence, a conversation with Mark Tabergian, CEO of BNY Mellon's Pershing Custody Solution. I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is Mindy Diamond on Independence. This podcast is available on our website, diamond-consultants.com and on wealthmanagement.com, as well as iTunes and other resources. I'm humbled by the incredible response to this podcast series, which as of this recording has more than 23,000 downloads and is growing every day. I've been thrilled to welcome as my guests many industry leaders and top advisors who've made the leap to independence. But I must be honest, having Mark Tabergian, the chief executive of BNY Mellon's Pershing Custody Unit, is a real home run for me, and for a few reasons. Truth be told, Mark is responsible for having helped to shape my own understanding and knowledge of the RIA space, and for that, I'm eternally grateful. Mark joined Pershing in 2007 after serving as a principal at the accounting and consulting firm Moss Adams where he was chairman of the Financial Services Industry Group and partner in charge of the Business Valuation Group. Quite simply, Mark is an icon, one of the smartest people I know, and probably has the best perspective on what it takes for independent firms to succeed, how to build a firm the right way, and what will shape the next decade of the business. I'm so excited by the opportunity to share the spotlight with author, thought leader, CEO, and friend, Mark Tabergian. So, Mark, thank you so much for joining me by phone today. You're welcome. Looking forward to it. Great. The role of the custodian has changed significantly in the past decade, certainly during the time you've been with Pershing. Would love it if you would share with us the work that the firm does for prospective breakaways and then to support RIAs post-launch and throughout their life cycles. I think that the idea of the role of the custodian changing is a little bit of an illusion because the reality is that the whole reason why RAs pick custodians on behalf of their clients is to ensure the safety of their clients' assets and proper record keeping. It creates this independence so that they have their role as fiduciary and somewhere else for safekeeping of the assets. And in light of what's happened during the crisis, it's important to recognize that that's the role. That said, there's much that custodians do that add value to the relationship because the notion of custody seems to be commoditized in the minds of many. So when we look at those who are breaking away and forming their own firms, we recognize that they're making a fundamental change from being an employee to being a business owner, from being a broker to being a fiduciary advisor, from being a product advocate to being a client advocate. So everything we do is really geared around helping them with the business of financial advice, how they think strategically about their business, how they implement and execute on technology, how they get access to whole of market so that they can serve their clients as effectively as possible, and how they can begin this transition in a way where they can run their business most efficiently and serve their clients most effectively. And so how do you believe that Pershing differentiates itself from its major competitors, say Fidelity, Schwab, and TD? When we looked at the business uh, 10 years ago to be serving RIAs more aggressively, one of the things that we went into this uh, recognizing is that there were gaps in the marketplace. And so the first thing we examined were the trends, like what was happening to the business of financial advice? What were people doing in terms of serving different market constituencies? We also looked at the three dominant firms at the time and said, let's look at them respectfully, which is how we approach the business anyhow, and acknowledge what they do well and attempt to be at par with that so that we could differentiate where we choose to be unique. So as we look at the marketplace, there's several things that we're doing differently. One is we are focused on professionally managed, growth-oriented firms who serve clients with complex lives. That's different than the discount retail brokerage platforms that tend to exist or those that are built off of the mutual fund industry. It's really focused on professional businesses going up market to serve uh, wealthy clients. 
We're the only custodian that delivers both bank and brokerage custody. And this is important in the high net worth space, especially if you have foundations and trusts in multi-generational circumstances that you're dealing with. Uh, BNY Mellon, our parent, is the largest custodian in the world. We are fully integrated. We go forward as BNY uh, Mellon Pershing uh, as a company. Uh, we are as integrated as we possibly can and continue to leverage that. This means we give access to our boutiques for specialized solutions like custom cash management uh, offerings. Uh, we are an international business. Uh, we have uh, clients in 50 countries. Uh, we have a heavily uh, oriented focus towards Latin America. We have offshore solutions that are critical to each of these markets, and this becomes compelling in the market. So when people are attempting to go independent, one of the things we put a great emphasis on is that our business is to ensure you build your brand, not leverage our brand, except to the extent that we can be an extension of what you're trying to accomplish. And when you go to market to be the largest, to be working with the largest custodian in the world, that is also a global systemically important bank. That's a very strong proposition to go to market with. And so the fact that Pershing on the RIA side is the smallest with just over 750 firms under its umbrella, how do you think that the size impacts someone's decision to break away and which custodian to use? Well, first of all, I wouldn't say we're the smallest. Uh, we're actually very close to the size of Fidelity is in the marketplace. Uh, Schwab clearly being the, the first to market and the market leader has more assets than we do. But in reality, we're very close to fidelity and larger than TD in the marketplace today in terms of assets. But that's not the significant issue. The significant issue is that we choose to work with a smaller community of advisors, and those are the larger firms. So our average relationship is over $800 million dollars. Our next nearest competitor is not yet 400 million. The com next competitor after that is 170 million. So our community of clients tend to be larger and their average household tends to be larger as well. So that is the choice that advisors have to decide on is whether or not they want to be a number in a large pool or they want to be working with the custodian that is focused on their community of advisors. And so the independent space, I think you'd agree, has morphed into something really spectacular. In fact, the exponential growth of it being a phenomenon no one would ever have predicted a decade ago. So from where I sit, the most awesome thing is that billion-dollar-plus teams are regularly and routinely leaving the wirehouse world to become entrepreneurs. In your opinion, what are some of the factors that you think that's driven this momentum? Well, there are several things that are interesting in that one is some do think that the RA phenomenon is only a decade old. And in reality, this goes back to the 1940s. But the retail-oriented RA started to emerge about 30 years ago. Then they tended to be advisors, solo practitioners dealing with a book. Uh, the biggest change, I think, in the last decade is exactly the point you made, Mindy, is that we're seeing larger practices emerge out of captive organizations where people are saying, I don't want to be a product pusher anymore. I don't want to be on the grid. What I want to be is an entrepreneur, a business owner operating under a fiduciary standard where I don't have to worry about what my company is saying in terms of the proprietary solutions. And I think the biggest catalyst is that many advisors have been trained to be more planning oriented as well as uh, having a strength in investing. And their captive organizations have, have restrictions on how they can behave. They limit their access to technology. They limit their access to financial solutions. And these entrepreneurs, these advisors, those acting as fiduciaries are saying, we need to give access to our clients to greater choice. And so the only way we can do this is to go to a platform that supports our business model. And do you think that this trend will continue? There's no reason to think it won't. What's significant is that I think that there will always be brokerage models. The issue is not just going from captivity to independence, but it's going from suitability to fiduciary. It's going from product advocate to client advocate. And I think that most people are coming into the business today think that sounds right and feels right. And the way in which they want to work with their clients uh, touches their clients in a way that's meaningful. So as we look at the evolution of the financial services profession, 
consumers, investors, clients are demanding a different relationship that is not just about what product is going to be sold to them, but what are their advisors going to be doing that will be transformative to their lives. So currently we see an incredible flow of assets uh, continuing into the RA space. Uh, we have a unique perspective, again, being the largest custodian in the world, in that we see all types of brokers, advisors, asset managers, and where the money goes. And we can tell you just from observation in our world that the amount of movement towards uh, fiduciary assets is exponential. But what of the fact that many wirehouse advisors consider themselves fiduciary? So you're right. Technically, they're held to a suitability standard, not a fiduciary one. But they think of themselves as fiduciaries. They would never dream of doing anything that wouldn't put their clients' interests first. How would you respond to that? I think that that is exactly one reason why they leave, because they in their own mind perceive that they're fiduciaries and operate in their clients' own interests. But the reality is that the way in which their firms behave or manage them or force them to think in terms of productivity or products may cause them to operate in conflict with what they fundamentally believe. I think that, frankly, is one of the catalysts for teams leaving captive environments that are not designed to support their business model. Yeah, I often say I agree with you. I think one of the things we talk about a lot with advisors is a feeling of incongruence between who they are, how they think about their business and serving clients and what they're allowed to do and sort of the beliefs of the firm for whom they work. In fact, just related to that, Mindy, I was uh, I was at a presentation the other day where I was uh, hearing a research firm present on what uh, FAs uh, want and expect and need going forward. And there was such an emphasis on product where the whole discussion was, uh, these are the products that the FAs would like to be able to sell. You know, this is discordant. This doesn't make sense to me because when you're acting as a client advocate, you're looking more holistically in that relationship and you're not selling product anyhow. You're helping clients to make choices in their financial lives that include investment solutions, but include other choices as well. And it has nothing to do with whether you're going to be aligning with factor-based investing or ETFs or any other things that might be on the grid. It's what's the combination that's going to make sense. Mm -hmm. The customized conversation. Yep. Yeah. I know that Pershing itself has grown from 50 billion in AUM in 2008 to 600 billion in just 10 years, which is extraordinary. In the almost 11 years that you've been at the helm of BNY Pershing, the RAA unit, what are the most impactful changes you've seen in the industry and what do you expect for the future? This is a profession that has been evolving, I think, for multiple decades, but the last decade has really accelerated the change. I think maybe 20 years ago, the typical advisor was investment forward and then became planning forward. What we're seeing now is that advisors are becoming experience forward. They're thinking about how do they create an experience for their clients that is memorable, that is not just about delivering a report or a performance in the portfolio. I think the second thing that's changing is advisory firms are becoming larger. You know, there's 28,000 RIAs in the country, roughly 12,000 of them are SEC registered, meaning over 100 million of assets. But out of that, there's only 650 that are greater than a billion in assets. I think we see a rapid rate of consolidation. I think we see multiple locations happening within the business. That adds a layer of complication. And I see more and more large firms saying, I've chosen to start a larger business to serve my clients, not to manage the business. So I'm going to hire professional management into the enterprise in order to drive it forward. I think the third element of that is that true wealth managers today are thinking about how they can leverage technology. But the shift is rather than people being enabled by the technology, it's reversing. The notion that technology can be a power in how they deliver on that client experience is growing in importance. And so selecting partners that can help them navigate through those choices becomes really critical. The final thing that I would say is I think the risk profile is also changing. Uh, this may be one of the areas of concern that those breaking ways should be aware of, but 
When you leave a captive environment, one of the things that you're leaving behind is the control process that those broker dealers provided to you. And so when you go independent, you're now on your own. And what many of these newly minted entrepreneurs have to be conscious of is that the risk now falls on them and how they manage it really becomes critical as part of their discipline. That's a scary thing for a lot of prospective breakaways, the notion of suddenly now being responsible for something that's very turnkey. And what's ironic is those captive wirehouse advisors are actually feeling scared because they're vulnerable, because compliance departments today are managing to the lowest common denominator. But still, despite that vulnerability, many of them don't move because they're terrified of having to take on the responsibility of compliance. What would you say to that? Well, I think to your earlier point about if you already believe that you're a fiduciary and you're adhering to the highest standards of behavior and you know what your partners and employees are doing when you're not looking, then I think the idea of creating your own business where you are accountable for what happens within your business also means you'll be rewarded for the risk that you're taking. So you have to use the right controls for doing it and you have to have the right partners that are helping you implement processes that are standardized and that give you comfort in how you approach your business. But this is the big difference between being an employee and being an employer. And if you really have that entrepreneurial spirit, you're going to say, I understand what I have to do to mitigate risk, but I also understand what I have to do to make the decisions that are right for my clients and for my employees. Yeah. And it goes to the fact that independence is not for everyone. It's indisputable that in the long run, the economics are better and who wouldn't want more freedom and control. But in the end, if you are risk averse, independence is probably not for you. Yeah, that that's true. And I And you know what's interesting is that almost every one of the breakaway teams that we see, and we see very large ones, uh, we probably prevail in half the opportunities that, uh, that we get a look at with these large teams. And one of the things that each of them has proved is they can make money. So you almost can take that one off the table is the question is whether they can manage their business effectively and generate not just a return for their labor, which they're doing today, but re- generate a return for the risk, which is the opportunity in being an entrepreneur. Yeah. Mark, you talk a lot about how the business of financial advice has transformed over time. I'd love to hear your perspective on the topic. Well, the business of financial advice, as I mentioned earlier, has transformed in terms of what uh, clients now expect of financial professionals. One thing we know is that we're always being compared to the best experience anybody's ever had. And so we have to think about what that means. As an example, we have an advisor client uh, in the South that recognizes all of its clients enjoy luxury travel. So one of the ways in which they've enriched the experience is they've brought on a concierge into their business to serve those clients. You don't normally think of that as a wealth management function, but that's part of the ease of doing business and the financial uh, choices that individuals are making. And so when I look at the business of financial advice, I think that the three questions that advisors have to answer uh, in serving their clients is, will our clients be successful in achieving what they want to achieve with us? Two, is it easy to do business with us? And three, will they be emotionally fulfilled by the experience? That's a whole different definition than saying, we're going to deliver this portfolio and you're going to get an outsized return. Different conversation. Even for those who are financial planners, this is another change that's occurring, is that financial planners or financial planning used to be an event and now it's a dynamic process in that the types of things that you're dealing with on a constant and consistent basis in working with clients is how you navigate all their choices. For example, How do you help them develop a philanthropic plan, not just how you help them select a charitable or a donor fund? How do you help them think about transferring their wealth in a way that's going to make an impact, not just to the children, but to other things that might be important to them? So there's this emotional connection that is new to the business where before we tended to be very left brain. Now we're introducing other elements into the relationship that are different. And it's probably for that reason that we're going to see advisory firms have a combination of financial experts and emotional or psychological experts who are involved in the relationships 
dealing with all aspects of the human or the family that we have to consider. I also think that uh, what we see is in the past, especially among RIAs, people had books of business and they did not have transferable value. Now what we're seeing are true enterprises where they are generating uh, earnings beyond the reward for labor and that creates transferable value for these businesses that we've never seen before. Mm. All very exciting. Many of our listeners are prospective breakaways who are seriously considering a move to independence. And while their short-term concerns often focus on how best to get from here to there and the economics of a move and whatnot, as they become more certain that they want to make the leap, they begin to focus on the big picture, as they should. And the real question becomes, so once I climb over the wall and I'm free to make any and all decisions on behalf of my business and my clients, what are the things to be focused on in order to ensure growth? So if you begin with the end in mind, what are those things? There are several things to consider. The first that I would say is that in the best managed advisory firms, uh, they recognize that their very best employee is more important than their very best client. And that almost sounds like heresy to the typical advisor, but if you think about it, uh, your very best employee can be a point of leverage in your business, uh, unlike what your very best client can be. So if you surround yourself with the right people and create an environment where motivated people will flourish, that's going to be important to you. But hiring people and managing people and developing people have to be done in context. So I look at this as sort of a linear process. First question What's your strategy, meaning can you define who your optimal client is and what that client experience will be? Two, can you create a structure that supports your strategy? As an example, if you're focused on the high net worth market, but all of your employees are trained in the retirement space, is that a mismatch of the talent that you have? Should you be managing people differently and thinking about your processes differently? Third, aligning the human capital strategy with your vision for the enterprise. Four, focusing on profitability, because that is critical for being an entrepreneur, is are you achieving the right returns for the risk you're taking? And five, do your processes work the way they're intended? And so I think that for most growing practices, when they are inefficient in how they're approaching their business, they don't have time to think about growth. And that ultimately bleeds the independent advisor dry. Yeah, and I think people are often so focused on the what's right in front of them. Let me make sure that my clients follow. Let me make sure that I've funded the transition well. Let me get over the fear of making the move. That And they rely upon whatever they've done to grow their business when they've been a captive. And as you've just laid out, the things that it takes to run a successful business and really accelerate growth can often be very different than what fuels growth as a captive employee. Exactly. And and as you know, Mindy, I've been around this business uh, for many, many decades and created the first benchmarking study back in the 80s of advisory practices. And it's interesting in observing the trends from decade to decade. And one of the things that's particularly interesting now is that the rate of organic growth within advisory firms is nowhere where it should be. And I say that because there's an undersupply of advisors and an oversupply of clients, but the rate of growth is not keeping up with the market. And I think why that happens is most advisory firms are not investing in the capacity to grow. And in fact, their new revenue compared to their existing revenue is only 5 to 10% of the total. So there is a real opportunity for breakaway teams to become market dominators in their communities. And so, frankly, if I had to start over again, I'd be thinking seriously about how I could create a locally market dominant business that is clearly differentiated in the community I want to serve. Yeah, it, as you were answering that question, that's what was going through my mind is that it sounds like there's a real opportunity then to differentiate yourself from the pack. Okay, so with the notion of beginning with the end in mind, many would be business owners or all would be business owners need to decide out of the gate if they're looking to build a hundred year business, a legacy, if you will, or a firm to be flipped. Why does that matter? 
it doesn't matter whether they build a hundred a business to last for a hundred years or build a business to flip. What matters is how they define success. And I think that there are many people who have a short-term view of business success, and so they can build up value quickly and create their own net worth quickly. I think the only thing that they have to be concerned about as a fiduciary, if that they're structuring a business to flip, is whether or not their clients will be taken care of with the receiving party. And I do worry about that a little bit, because if it's just an economic decision, that becomes an issue. If they're thinking about building an enduring business, I wrote a book on this last year on the enduring advisory firm, is that there are many elements that come into play, but I'm not sure that uh, that everyone who is starting an advisory firm has thought in terms of what that means, because owner-operated businesses tend to reflect the personality of the dominant advisor of that business. If they really want to have an enduring firm, they have to make themselves obsolete. And that is really, really difficult for founders of businesses. But being a founder and being a leader are two different characteristics. This is the transition that I think the breakaway teams really have to be thinking about is to say, it's no longer about me. It's about the business that I'm building. So how do I create a structure and a framework and attract the right kinds of people in order to make this last? And what are your thoughts on succession planning? This really goes hand in hand with the question of succession planning. I think that many confuse the term succession planning and sale planning. Succession planning means that you're going to provide an orderly transition of clients and you're going to provide an orderly transition of management. If you do those t- things right, then you're going to be able to provide an orderly transition of ownership, but you can't get those out of sequence. So. When we look at succession planning today, I think that what's happening is that many practices are being sold with clients that are older than the advisor himself. And what that means is that the buyer is acquiring a depleted oil well. If you want to create something with transferable value, you have to think about what people will be in place, both in terms of clients and employees that will continue what we've created. And that is where the opportunity is. I think I would say that 90% of the advisory firms in the country today have an inadequate succession plan or none at all. And if I were working in a larger firm, I'd want to be uh, pushing the founders of this business to think about business continuity, not business ending. Yeah. Pivoting for a moment to the decision-making process. So let's go back in time to the decision-making process between remaining an employee, so someone who's currently working for a big brokerage firm, or becoming a business owner. Every prospective breakaway would like to wave a magic wand and get from where they are today to the land of independence. What do you believe are the most impactful decisions and actions that would ensure a successful leap? Probably the most impactful decision that people could make is whether they're emotionally ready to run a business. I wouldn't say it's inertia. It's almost fear that keeps people from realizing their potential as an independent business owner. We talked about this earlier in terms of what causes people to hold back. And I think it's this realization that their DNA may be more of an employee than it is an entrepreneur. And you have to overcome that. It's like dealing with clients who have a different risk profile than you. So that emotional commitment is key because once you step off the cliff, there's no going back. Knowing that, you have to sort of say, what are the areas that most concern me or give me the greatest anxiety in the sleep? Is it, will my clients follow? Can I make as much money or more doing what I did before? Is it my need for working capital in order to operate this business for three or six months just in case the revenue doesn't come in? Is it compliance risk? Is it employee risk? Is it the ability to grow? And so you all have to isolate each of those decisions. And once you are clear on it, set it aside. I think what we find oftentimes with uh, teams that are breaking away is they raise the issue, they address the issue, then they keep coming back to it instead of putting it aside and working on the next one. And that becomes a distraction for many and causes them to have a really long gestation period in the execution. I agree with you because I think self-awareness 
is and self-honesty are probably the most important precursors in a decision like this because, as we said, independence is not for everyone. You have to know yourself. If you don't have a certain tolerance for risk, a tolerance for flexibility, for learning to do things a different way, a tolerance for thinking more long-term as opposed to just focusing on the short-term, if you don't have a sense of self-confidence, then the reason I think a lot of advisors begin to focus on some of those those issues you just mentioned is because they become smoke screens for what the real issue is, which I'm not necessarily emotionally ready to run a business. And by the way, that's not a pejorative. Independence isn't meant to be for everyone. It's exciting. It's interesting, but only for those that really want it. Right. And frankly, I think this is why there's an advantage in working with, with your firm, because you've done this on your own. You've created your own business. You've created a successful, dominant recruiting and development firm in the marketplace. So even though it's not uh, directly financial services, it's a service firm that you're thinking about. So if you're one of those individuals contemplating this move, part of this is talking to other entrepreneurs like you to say, what worked, what didn't work? If you had to do it all over again, what would you change? What are the real fears and what are the uh, made up fears that you have to think about? So I think that being a little bit vulnerable in talking to people who've already made these decisions in their own lives would be valuable to the breakaway teams. I think that's really good advice. Mark, I know you have strong feelings about selling equity, and I'm hoping you'll share a little bit of your perspective on that. I think that uh, having been, this is now my seventh career, and having run several different businesses, and having served as a partner in an accounting firm, I kind of have developed, I wouldn't call it a jaded view, but a concerned view about how individuals view equity in their business. Going back to the issue of whether you want to build an enduring firm, if you don't think about how you share ownership and how you make it more inclusive for people to become part of your business, then there's no way that this business is going to continue. You will ultimately have to sell the enterprise. But it's also recognition that you're growing and investing in people and they are contributing to your wealth. And so where you might consider uh, the sale of equity dilution of your ownership, the reality is that they've already enriched you by their presence if they hit certain thresholds. Now the question is, how do you invite them into the process? I do have a bias towards selling equity instead of giving equity, but under the right kinds of plans, you can structure it so that people earn ownership in your business over time. I think the real question is whether you have a systematic process for building a true partnership structure instead of one that's random, that is not tied to any sort of benchmarks or scorecards, and that is not strategic in how you grow. And what about a firm, an established firm, or even a prospective breakaway that has a need to access capital or unlock liquidity, whether it be on the way in or at some point in the middle of the game. What are your feelings about selling equity at those points in time to an outside party? As a practical matter, I'm not opposed to the notion of private equity, but I think that what people have to realize is that uh, equity is the most expensive form of capital. It's permanent. And the rights that passive investors have in your business, particularly in terms of distributions of income, are quite demanding. And so if you're going to take equity from a private source, it shouldn't be for liquidity. It should be for growth. It should be for driving the outcome. If you're thinking about how you're going to finance your business, though, it's healthy to look at debt as an option. And I think that the DNA of advisors is to view debt as a negative, but some debt is good. And business debt is natural. It's, it's called financial leverage within a business. Uh, it is uh, If your cash flow is sufficient to, to repay the funding, then you should do it because it's short-term and it's cheaper. So uh, I think that this is where many breakaway teams and uh, actually existing advisors really have to begin understanding what a balance sheet tells you, the purpose of funding a business, and how you can structure this in a way that makes economic sense. But frankly, most RIAs do not have balance sheets. This is probably the next evolution in sophistication for professional management of these firms. Yeah, and the the cottage industry born to support the space will continue to expand as well. And and I might add, though, Mindy, that 
One of the things that I take great pleasure in seeing is the amount of private equity money that's coming into the business. If that doesn't validate this business model, I don't know what does. I mean, this is smart money coming into the wealth management business and saying, we want a part of this. The question is whether you want to share it uh, so quickly or if there's another way to do it. Yeah, smart money indeed. Mark, why do you believe independence is better for clients? I'm sure we could talk for hours on it, but give us your top few reasons. I think that, again, I wouldn't necessarily say independence by itself is better for clients because the bigger you become as a firm, the less independent you are. So I think that the fiduciary advisory model has great value for clients uh, in that uh, there's a level of transparency that occurs. Uh, The custodian is separate from the advisory business, so there is a checks and balance that happens in the relationship. Fiduciary advisors have access to whole of market in terms of what they can recommend for solutions. And they don't have to be paid on the grid where there is a performance measure that's unrelated to client needs. So there's a closer alignment to the way in which clients want to be served to how fiduciary advisors behave. And I think this, by the way, is one reason why so many broker dealers have been investing in their advisory platforms and trying to get to that point of saying, I recognize the trend. I have to be in line with what's going on there. Mm. And looking forward, what do you think will shape the next 10 years of this business? There are several things that I think are going to shape it. I think that the rate of consolidation will accelerate. It wouldn't surprise me, for example, in 10 years to see 10 or 12 dominant national firms, to see 50 or 60 super regional RIA firms, to see two to 300 dominant local firms in the marketplace. So I think uh, just generally in size, I think that we're going to see some real shifts in the market, just like we saw in accounting and law. So I think, frankly, that's a good model to be looking at. Second, I think there's going to be a shift in the relationship that advisors have with custodians. I think ultimately there's going to be an expectation that the advisor pays the custodian directly rather than having the clients pay for the access to the custodian. So this will have implications for the economics of the advisory firms. They have to be thinking about that. Third, I think that advisors will experience margin pressure from different elements. I think they have to be focused on productivity, pricing appropriately. And in fact, it wouldn't surprise me to see more advisors evolve away from asset-based pricing to relationship-based pricing. Uh, This is the only business I know where the client pays based on the value they bring rather than the value the advisor brings. And ultimately, clients will demand a different relationship. It would be like my doctor charging me by the pound. I would be overpaying (laughs) all the time. So we have to be thinking about what that means going forward and how you define that relationship, especially if you hold yourself out as a wealth manager or financial planner. Just tying pricing to assets seems to be incongruous. Mm. And what do you predict for technology that will sub- continue to support the independent space? I think, uh, and this is reflective of the way in which we've thought about it, is that there are different types of uh, advisors. There are those who are complete outsources of technology, and there are those who are integrators of technology, and those who are pickers of select technology. I think that uh, the larger firms tend to want to be integrated, and they want to have the flexibility to trade what they might be using now for something better. There are so many fintech companies supporting the space today that the choices are overwhelming. The opportunity for advisors is to say, what business am I in and which combination of technology and underlying supporting platform, the custodian, is going to be best to help me grow my business? It will make a difference if you're in the high net worth market, the retirement market, the mass affluent market, how you make those choices. Mm. One final question, and it's killing me to have to go to the final question because you are just such an incredible wealth of information, and I love to listen to your perspective on the industry. But what advice would you offer prospective breakaways about preparedness or mistakes to avoid? Well, I think that the lesson I would take in thinking about breaking away is the same lesson that you try to teach your clients is that oftentimes people come to you with a liquidity event or a change in life circumstances, and they're confronted with this choice of, are you the right 
person for me to be working with or the right team to be working with? And what kinds of questions should I be answering in order to give me comfort with that? And how are you going to navigate these choices? What I would try to do if I were contemplating a breakaway is treating myself as the client, is to say, I'm about to embark on a life choice. And it's clear that the economics support what I do. It's clear that the business model is proven, so there should be no question. Now where I'm at is a personal decision as to whether managing my own business, taking my own risks, not being an employee is going to be right for me and fulfill what I'm trying to do personally. That's where I think the big catalyst for many of these will come. Mm, I think that's really solid advice. Mark, as I said, I could listen to you all day, but I think we've reached our limit and I've taken up enough of your time. I thank you so very much for sharing your insights and perspectives so graciously with us. My pleasure, Mindy. Thanks for asking and thanks for including me in your program. Mark shared countless words of wisdom, not just about breaking away, but also on building a business poised for growth, maximum enterprise value, and future readiness. A few things stood out for me. They are, one, the biggest change in the last decade has been that larger practices are moving away from their captive organizations because clients' expectations are changing and they're demanding that their advisors act as fiduciaries. Two, breakaway teams have proven that they can manage money. What needs to be determined is if they can, in fact, manage a business. And three, the most important question a prospective breakaway can ask himself is if he's emotionally ready to run a business. In our next episode, Liz Nesvold, founder and managing partner of Silver Lane Advisors, will be joining us. Her firm, is among the top M&A advisors to many of the most successful companies in wealth management, investment consulting, institutional asset management, and the insurance space. I think you'll agree, Liz is incredibly well positioned to share her insights on what it takes to build an RIA with the end game in mind. So I hope you'll join us for what I'm sure will be a really interesting conversation. Until then, I encourage you to visit our website, diamond-consultants.com, and click on the tools and resources link for valuable content. And if you're not a recipient of our weekly email, Perspectives for Advisors, click on the blog link to browse recent articles. Feel free to email or call me if you have specific questions, either at mdiamond at diamond-consultants.com or by phone at 908 879 one zero zero two. Please know that all requests are handled with complete discretion and confidentiality. Thank you so much for listening. I also want to thank wealthmanagement.com for sharing this podcast with their viewers and subscribers. This is Mindy Diamond on Independence. <music>